Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, MNT Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Perfect Building Maintenance. Additional funding has been provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Avison Young, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, Cohen Equities, Colliers International, NYC, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Genova Burns, Handro Properties, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., Peoples United Bank, Polsonelli, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, Maringoff Family Foundation, The Moynian Group, and these friends. It's called ferries. It's light rail. It's other means of public transportation. But in order for the city and the region to grow, we need these alternative means of transportation. So today I've assembled this group of distinguished business leaders who will provide their insight and their thoughts on the subjects of public transportation. Um, I guess include Jeff Levine, who is the chairman and CEO of Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, and Clinton Management. Peter Brosnick, who is the Senior Vice President at SJP Properties. And last but not least, Seth Pinsky, who is the Executive Vice President at RxR Realty. So since you were in the public, okay, you were in the administration for how many years? Uh, ten years. Okay. So ten years administration, and now you've been on the dark side for what, three years? About three and a half. Three and a half years. In order for areas to grow, especially with your company that you're involved with, how, how are we going to get people around? Because that's the biggest detriment that we have in the, in the neighborhood to grow our communities. You know, the interesting thing about the region is that uh, over the last 10 or 20 years, we've seen almost all of the growth occurring in the core of the region. And uh, what has happened over time is that the core has kind of expanded as it's become more expensive and people have been pushed out to one level out, two levels out, three levels out, et cetera. Um, but still, if you look at population growth in the region, it's largely occurred in the city as opposed to outside of the city. If we're going to continue to grow and accommodate people in an affordable way, in addition to growing the city and, and developing in the city, we also have to find ways to spread the development out. And public transportation is really the key to being successful at, at spreading people out because the idea is not to create sprawl like we've done in the past where it's difficult for people to access jobs and, and other services. You want them to be able to get to the core easily, but to be able to develop over a larger area. So let's talk about some of the developments you're involved with today and the, the alternative transportation. Well, um, we're developing all over the region, um, but what we're in particular looking at um, uh, and have been looking at over the last couple of years has been uh, transit-oriented development um, in suburban downtowns. and. 
what we found is that there's a desire, especially among young professionals and also uh, empty nesters, to have a walkable, uh, to live in a walkable environment where there's diversity and character. Um, but they often either can't afford or don't want to live right in the city center. And so what we've been looking at is areas where you have that diversity, you have that walkability, um, but uh, where with the help of public transportation, you can access the core uh, without having to pay core prices. And so uh, we have, for example, a 440 unit development that we're uh, under construction on in Yonkers, which is a 30 minute train ride uh, from Midtown Manhattan. We have a uh, 10 million square foot master development project that we've worked on with the city of New Rochelle and our partners Renaissance Development uh, that uh, again is a 30 minute uh, train ride into Grand Central. We have a master development project on over 50 acres in Glen Cove, um, which not only is accessible to a number of Long Island Railroad stations, but also will have a ferry service that will take people from the development directly into Midtown Manhattan. So. Um, for us, uh, what we're looking to create is that urban feel, um, but to do it in places where the rents that we can charge and, and the, the cost of living is going to be significantly lower. Jersey has been active in public transportation and also in light rail. How has it helped in the development of your buildings and tenants coming to them? So in Hoboken in particular, you know, Waterfront Corporate Center has been very successful uh, right on the, on the water in the southern part of Hoboken. And really that transit terminal is New Jersey's most active transit hub. You have the light rail, you have ferry, you have the path, you have NJ Transit, and you have bus. And for us in New Jersey, it's all about accessing labor to both Hoboken and Jersey City. And those modes of transportation have been critical you're pulling from the east, you have the accessibility of NJ Transit coming from the west and the western New Jersey suburbs. But it's really changed uh, as these communities grow around sort of the, the necessity of the, uh, the commutation, you're starting to see more and more, you know, cool things happen in downtown Jersey City. And Hoboken is, is a brand that's unique, I think special unto itself. You know, you have a walkable transit village. If we were to plan a city together outside of New York, we probably couldn't have done a much better job than Hoboken. But you also are in New Newark. Let's talk about Newark. So in Newark, you know, you have a little bit different system, but you have, um, again, good accessibility from Penn Station. And then you have the Broad Street Station with an independent light rail system that uh, gives you access from uh, the southern part, if you will, New York, uh, Newark Penn Station, up to the northern part of the market. And there too, um, the, the connections are really uh, the key, the catalyst for the strength of the city. And then you're starting to see the retail and the residential fill in around the northern part of the Newark market by Military Park, by Washington Park. And uh, the transformation's been tremendous. Now, in the green room, you had mentioned that one of the, the difficulties of the ferry system is the cost. Correct. Yeah, for us, our tenants, I think, would love to leverage the, the ferry systems and utilize them more often. They're extremely convenient and quick. Um, the eight-minute ride to downtown Manhattan or midtown Manhattan from either the Paulus Hook, uh, Newport, or even uh, Hoboken terminals is incredibly desirable. But the challenge is that, um, you know, $16 to get you back and forth is expensive. And the monthly passes, even from places as far south as Middletown, can be prohibitively expensive. But it's uh, the most convenient form of transportation for a lot of people coming from uh, the New Jersey suburbs or the southern part of the state. Ferry has been very helpful to you in Williamsburg. Let's talk about that. Well, absolutely. When we built the edge in Williamsburg, and now we built over 2,000 units on the waterfront at North 5th, 6th, and 7th at the East River, we were zoned to build the ferry, and we had no idea what that pier and what that ferry would do to activate the area. The fact of the matter is, since the ferry was run approximately three years ago now, um, we're approaching, I think in 2017, over two million passengers on the ferry system. Uh, I believe almost 30% of them get on and off at the Williamsburg stop. Um, I believe that going forward with the commitment the mayor has just made to enhance ferry service, more stops, they're projecting as many as 5 million passengers on the now ferry what, system. What is the cost? Because Peter brought up the $8 
uh, each way over there. What is the cost? In New it? York, it's currently $4, but there's a subsidy proposed to put into place with the expansion, which will level it with that of a subway or bus right. at 275 The new citywide ferry system, which is supposed to start the summer, uh, is a 275 the same price as a metro. Uh, and it also includes a transfer, which I'm not sure that it, today you have that uh, transfer. No, you do not have so, it today. So this, the, the, the availability of taking the ferry, getting off at a stop, and then getting to a subway will make the opportunities much greater. But I think we're really in the infancy. I mean, you look at New York City with its rivers and its piers, and the reality is it would be optimum for us to utilize to a higher degree. And I believe we're just at the cusp of that now because in putting in these ferry stops, we need to modernize it. We need to have electronic access, which I believe is being anticipated. It's something very important. It's a beautiful thing to wait on the river in the spring or the fall or the summer for a ferry. But in the cold wind of the river in December, it can be less attractive. So I think that the next step has to be to create proper shelters so people can wait in a safe environment until that ferry comes. But I think that that relates a little bit to what Seth said before on the transit-oriented developments. If you look at the transit-oriented developments that took place in New Jersey, Morristown, certain communities, and Long Island, what they've done is that they've built some retail. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a stop over there. There's, there's an additional, I mean, it could be even though it's a train, but there's more than just a a shelter bus stop. You have to see what comes first, the chicken or the egg. You know, you have to have people have retail, and you're saying the retail will come when but the But you know what? Have. But huh. let's look at certain real estate developers who built, including yourself, when you built on the Hust in the in the west part of the you know, the Hudson Yards area, West Chelsea. You know, west Chelsea. You put a you subsidize and put a bus. Absolutely. Okay? So the buses, which was a means of transportation, you know, the ferry system today, you know. The New Jersey ferry, they have the bus going across town. So that has been able to help. You were saying. Yeah, no, and, and you know, the, the ferries, um, I think, are a very important piece in the puzzle. Um, if you look at how much it costs us to build transit infrastructure in the New York area, it, in many ways, is, is almost cost prohibitive. It costs two or two and a half billion dollars to build an extension to Hudson Yards that is very important and is going to create a lot of economic activity, but was one station added to the subway system. Cost however many multiple billions of dollars to build three or four stations on the Second Avenue subway. The East River Ferry, uh, when it was launched by the Bloomberg administration, each of the, um, the docks cost about $10 million, somewhere between 10 and $15 million. And though the operating subsidy per passenger is certainly a lot higher than for rail, just because of the volume of ridership, because of the numbers that you're talking to relative to the subway system, even in gross numbers, the subsidy is not all that expensive. And so you really do get a lot more for your money. Um, and I think going forward, if we as a city hope to continue to expand, we have to look at less expensive ways of creating transit connectivity. Now, what about, yes, Peter? What I was gonna say is, you know, we're a little spoiled in New Jersey in that the ferries, the, once you're there, once you access the Gold Coast, if you will, the New Jersey Gold Coast, we don't have the challenge of, you know, trying to get to the, to the east side of Manhattan or to Brooklyn. So once you've made that journey across, when we're, you know, talking about pulling labor or accessibility or coming back and, if you live in Hoboken or Jersey City or Weehawken, the advantage of, of the ferry system on the, on the Gold Coast is that once you have arrived, you're basically where you need to be um, because all that development has happened uh, along the coast from basically Fort Lee down to, uh, to Bayonne, as far as Bayonne. What about the trolley, alleged, the trolley system that is in discussions? Okay, it's not, it may happen. What, what, what's your thoughts about the potential of the trolley system in Brooklyn and Queens? Well, we own uh, uh, several properties along um, the proposed route and, and we're very strongly supportive of it. I think, you know, again, um, any sort of expansion of the, the transit system is a positive. But for how the area. long, you know, in, in the same manner that you brought up the Second Avenue subway that took probably many, many more years than anyone would have expected. How long do you think it would take to get this trolley system in, in working? Look, it, it, these are long-term projects. They're projecting, it, I believe, planning actually in 2018 once they decide where the money's coming from, and then they anticipate its delivery in 2025. 
obviously that's ambitious. Yeah, and, and things take a long time in New York, and it's, it's one of the problems that New York has, and I think figuring out not just how to do things less expensively, but also figuring out how to do them more quickly is, is an important part of the puzzle. But I, I think that you know, we should be supportive of, and you should salute people who are planning the transit systems of the future, because that, again, you know, we, we can't keep squeezing more and more people into the same acreage. We have to spread it out. Let's take what Roosevelt Island has, you know, the tram, the, the tram, <laughs> the tram and, and the monorails. These, I mean, I think George Klein, uh, who's building in Astoria or... Uh, Not Astoria, he's building... The, Greenpoint. Greenpoint. At, at Greenpoint. the very north end of Greenpoint. At the end, he was thinking of a gondola or something. Yeah, you know, he was proposing a bridge to connect over, I believe, the Bushwick Inlet, which again, that would be wonderful to con for connectivity on the East River on the Brooklyn Queen side. But again, it's difficult. There is many, many governmental organizations involved in the approval of a bridge, or for that matter, a tram going over public waterways and such. <laughs> What's your thoughts about trams? <laughs> I, I mean, look, I, I'm in favor of, of any investment in infrastructure no, no, that but, happens. But, you know, but, you know, the issue with trams, I think, is exactly what, what Jeff said. You know, when you're going over a body of water, especially a navigable body of water, you not only have city regulations and state regulations, you have know. federal regulations as well. Army Corps play. of Engineers, you name it, they're involved. You know, you have the, the monorail or the rail system from Jamaica to Kennedy Airport, and I believe you have a similar one in Newark from... Newark Airport to the city of Newark. From a Correct. station yeah. on New York. From a right. station, okay. Mm -hmm. Don't you believe that, do you think that w is another way that we can help uh, in the growth of the city? Again, it has to be well conceived. The tram that you refer to that goes from Jamaica to Kennedy Airport, you have to get to Jamaica. So basically it's the train to the plane, which not very many people, I believe more employees of the airport are using that to get to work than air travelers are using it to get to the airport. Well, and, and another point I, I would just make quickly is that as important as new transportation uh, infrastructure is, we also have a lot of existing transit infrastructure that we're not utilizing to the fullest. And again, if you look out in the suburbs, it, it's almost criminal how many of our commuter rail lines, the stations on them are surrounded by surface parking lots. And uh, the good news is that, you know, because of some of the challenges that suburban communities have been facing in retaining certain populations and attracting businesses, that in the past where a lot of these communities were very resistant to development, especially any sort of density, I think increasingly they're realizing that that's really the ticket to their future. So in addition to the projects that I was describing before, we're also doing similar developments in Hempstead, in Huntington Station, in Stamford, and all over the region we have these commuter rail stations that are just there for, for the development. Um, and, and as long as we can overcome local opposition, which I think is increasingly becoming possible, um, there's a huge opportunity for us to utilize the infrastructure that we have. Metro North, this stop at, um, uh, at Yankee Stadium, okay? You know, it, it, the stadium's not open all year round, but the stop is open all year round, and it's helping some of the people who are living in that section of the Bronx relocate. I mean, you've said the Bronx has great opportunities. I, I didn't see in the plan any discussions about the ferry going to the Bronx. It goes to Soundview. Um, but also in addition to that, uh, in the Metro North Capital Plan, uh, there are three new stations that Metro North is going to be building in the Northeast Bronx. Um, and another, I think, important uh, uh, change that Metro North is, is in the process of instituting is that uh, once East Side Access opens and relieves some of the um, pressure on Penn Station, there's a plan to bring portions of the New Haven line into the west side. So a city like New Rochelle, for example, is going to have access not just to Grand Central, but also to Penn Station. Any idea when the, uh, the, the east side uh, Penn, Penn Station situation is going to take place? It's uh, a, a moving target, <laughs> uh, hopefully in the 2021-ish uh, Oh, it's uh, that range. long. But you're talking about suburban underutilized transportation. We have it right here in the five boroughs. Absolutely. You know, everybody talks about the possibilities of Rockaway and Coney Island evolving. It's beautiful waterfront. Um, it's theoretically in close proximity to employment centers, but the trains which allow people to come back and forth take over an hour. We should have focus on better train service. As you said before in our discussion, subsidizing housing over there is not going to work until you give them proper transportation. 
what about the buses? I mean, there is the plan right now, the discussion I think that was recently in the paper uh, because of what's going to happen that the L train is going to be closing, that they want to put buses that are going to on uh, 14th Street. Well, buses on 14th Street is just one part of a complex problem to deal with the 10 million passengers that come and go from the Bedford Street Station every year. The reality is Brooklyn is well served by public transportation, whether you go to the south to the JMZ over at Marcy and Broadway or north to Long Island City and the G and the 7, you can use subway transportation from parts of Brooklyn that are on the L train. So the city is talking about, number one, enhancing bus service north and south, MTA surface transportation to get people to those subway lines, as well as the enhanced ferry service. So overall, I think the situation, and again, I have a horse in the race having built quite a few units in Williamsburg, but I think it will be dealt with. They're anticipating that the work on the L train will take anywhere from 15 to 18 months on an expedited basis. Which means it'll take three years at least. Let, let's <laughs> hope not. Let's say it appears from recent results of MTA contractors that work has been going better. Maybe we're getting more experience. Remember, a lot of this uh, subgrade construction was a result of Hurricane Sandy when you were so actively involved in the city administration. And I think the contracting industry is getting more adept at handling it. Peter, there are plans right now to expand the, uh, the light rail into Bergen County. Where do you see that happening? Well, I think that that certainly helps with bringing the density down from Bergen County. You know, 900,000 some odd people coming from Bergen County um, or coming out of Bergen County and, you know, a good majority of those commuting uh, for jobs, accessing uh, Manhattan or, again, the, the Gold Coast. So that expansion is tremendously important. But I think to Seth's point, I mean, the, the initial light rail that they built was a $2 billion project. And I think we need to get more creative and not to get ahead of ourselves in terms of the future, but I see more, you know, shuttles, maybe not a bus isn't the word, but, you know, autonomous shuttles, if we're going that way, once they're safe, um, things that do ultimately alleviate some of that surface parking at the transit terminals, whether it's in the Bergen County uh, suburbs or the Morris County suburbs and utilizing or better utilization of those surface lots, um, maybe for some amenities next to uh, these transit oriented hubs uh, in, in the western suburbs. What you've done in West Chelsea and other areas and a number of people have done, you know, because they've gone to 11th Avenue, 12th Avenue, they've had, what about increasing the number of the van, of these buses? Shuttle buses. We shuttle run buses. private shuttle buses. No, no, uh, but what I'm saying, so do they. I mean, mm -hmm. SJP has a wonderful project called The Modern uh, in Fort Lee. They run a shuttle bus to the George Washington Bridge. Correct. Uh, Mercedes Sprinter buses take uh, the residents, you know, from the from the property over the bridge, and you know that's a little higher end. I think, uh, you know, no. it's you know, in order to institute those, we run things, Chevy buses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and you know, the, the, the modern is a special project, and it's a beautiful project. Um, but we could certainly institute more of that in our office uh, product in New Jersey, not just SJP properties, but uh, you know some of our competitors are in the western suburbs. I think those shuttles would, and they, they have. In the Meadowlands, you see it. Uh, you're starting to see it in towns like Morristown. Um, those shuttles are becoming very important, taking some of the pressure off I mean, our parking. The, the shuttles just in general in New York City, not the Mercedes, just the buses <laughs> in general, right taking people from their residence is very important. Well, again, we don't do what you do in Jersey. We're not going across the rivers with shuttles. My right. projects in West Chelsea, I was there before the 7 train, before the West Side Yards was put into place, and there was very cold walk from 11th Avenue to Penn Station where the subways existed. We ran shuttles. We brand the buses with our advertising so that they kill two birds in one stone. They take our tenants to the transportation as well as brand our project. Now, do you still have the shuttle? No, when they opened up the 7 train over at 33rd and 10th and 11th, we stopped doing it and everybody's very pleased to walk the block on so, after the subway. You know, what's interesting though about buses is that um, over the last 20, 30 years, ridership on the subway has almost doubled, um, but actually ridership on the buses in the city, public buses, have declined. And the reason for that is the buses get caught in the same traffic that cars and everyone else gets caught get caught in. and I think that that the opportunity that we have as a city and, and we've started to do this but only halfway 
is to look at real bus rapid transit where you have dedicated rights of way. And you know the BQX is an example of that. It happens to be on rails. But, but, but it's, what about it, the select service bus? I, yeah, no. And I, the, what I believe that which came in in your administration, the select service buses are really moving the moving much better. Yeah, they, they move much better, but they still, you know, the, the lanes still have people double park in them, people who are turning um, um, sometimes block the traffic. And if you've gone to cities around the world that have really robust bus rapid transit systems, you know, they basically operate like subways. Um, and that's something that I think over the long yeah, run New York should think I, about. I realize you live in Brooklyn and Jeff has a number of involvement in Brooklyn. One of my young colleagues told me that there's like a a small mini cars that you can take from one place to another place. Are you calling about the zip cars? No, no, this is not <laughs> yeah, the zip. The this car to go. I car think. to go, yeah. okay, <laughs> which is a, a system where They're you... smart cars. A, a smart car where you, let's say you want to go shopping and then you drop off the car, it's a smart car, and it works out. So though, that's also helped. Yeah, look, there, there are. It's it, we live in an interesting time. You have that. You have the you know the advent of Uber and um, the options for people to get around are are certainly increasing. But we're all squeezing onto the same roads and into the same tunnels. And um, you know we, we just have to figure out a way to to make our um, our infrastructure more robust. What, what about the increase in bicycles? Yeah, certainly we see city bikes being utilized uh, throughout Jersey City. I think, uh, you know, you, you have it in Hoboken as well. And with those those areas, you know, you just need to continue to expand upon it and grow, you know, grow those programs. Um, obviously, in these past few months, it's not an ideal mode of transportation. So you're limited to the season, but it certainly works. There's no question. Isn't it a rule now that I, you have I, to I make will, bike rooms? Uh, we have huge dedication. Right, for every apartment. Space for every, bicycles. Right, for every two Rivaling apartments. Rivaling our car parking, frankly. It's really incredible. We have new sophisticated systems for racking the banks, and people really do use these bicycles. I really think the city should pass a law requiring helmets for the city bikes, mm -hmm. because we all know yeah. we've seen or heard of tragedies, and it just seems foolish to me with everything we know about bicycle safety. So in summation, it sounds to me that the outlook is, is bright for well-planned alternative transportation systems, okay? As we were saying prior to the show, maybe the, the utilization of the line, the extra rail in Long Island, in uh, the Rockaways would help out over there. But one last question, which was written, but I've spoken about it many times, is the number seven is a great train. It's great that the Hudson Yards is there. But when all of the people move into the neighborhood and all the offices and all the new residential, will that area, will that station be able to be capable to supply? Well, I think the thing to remember about the seven train is it was actually designed to support the jet stadium. Uh, and so the capacity was designed to allow 50,000 people or 70,000 people to leave a single location, come all at once, and then jump on a train and and, uh, and go wherever they're going in the city. So, you know, look, it's going to be crowded. It's going to be crowded like everywhere. Has everybody York. here entered that train station and taken that escalator down into the bowels of the subway system? It's an incredible yeah. work of science and art, and I believe that the capacity will be there. Okay. <laughs> so I'd like to thank Jeff, Peter, and Seth, and I'll see you next week.